we're going to go through the Word. We're going to look at all the things that Scripture tells us to put on. And we started this last week by looking at the things that, that God's Word has caused us to put off. And I'll just remind you of those items real quick. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Romans 13, 12. Colossians 3, 8 says, But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication off your Facebook page and out of your mouth is actually what it says in Colossians 3 8. Verse 10 of Colossians 3 says, and, and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that has created him. So we talked last week about things that we need to put off. If you weren't here, I want to encourage you to, uh, to get back. Uh, uh, back into that and just kind of pull, pull from that. So let, let's turn back to the text here. We, we, we read before the prayer in Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to look at something again because you've heard me say many times that anytime you do not understand something's purpose, abuse is inevitable. If you've heard me say it in its register, say it out loud with me. Anytime you do not understand something's purpose, abuse is inevitable. And, and, and abuse can be neglect. You can neglect something and abuse it. If you don't use something and that thing begins to deteriorate by lack of use, that is the same as abuse. And so when it comes to this, this, this uniform, this armor that God has called us to put on, let's deal again with the reasoning behind why. Why should we be uh, thoughtful and intentional about having our armor on as if we're prepared for conflict or war or battle. What, what is it about this that, that uh, would help us to be more intentional? And so the purpose behind it is, if you look at verses uh, 11 and 12, well, actually even in the 13, notice what he says in verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God, and here's the reason why, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the strategies of the enemy, the strategies of the enemy that I'm able to, 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 to stand against, that I'm able to, to persevere and to overcome whatever the enemy has plotted. A, a verse that you'd want to put in your notes next to this verse is Isaiah 54, 17. Isaiah 54, 17, familiar verse, awesome promise to stand on. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Can you quote that out loud? No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. You know, the first man in the Bible to ever use a weapon to be destructive with it was Cain. Cain shed Abel's blood. So he picked up some kind of weapon and used it against Cain. That's interesting because that shows up in the fourth chapter of Genesis, but by the time you get to the fifth chapter and you see these generations of Adam and men begin to multiply on the earth, there was a man by the name of Tubal Cain that was named after Cain, and he is the first man in Scripture that molded metal together to create. He was a, 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 a craftsman, if you would, and he was named after Cain, and he was a creator of weapons. I bring that up because 1 John 3, 12 says that Cain was of the wicked one, which means you can date the agenda of the enemy all the way back to the first murder that ever took place. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the enemy, he comes to kill, he comes to steal, and he comes to destroy. That is his work. And a part of his strategy is forming weapons against us. But we have this promise in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. I want you to quote it again, except this time I want you to put some emphasis on the word formed. Let's say it again. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. So don't stay up all night wondering what the enemy might be up to and what is he strategizing or what is he coming up with or what kind of game plan does he have against your life? No, no weapon formed against me shall prosper prosper. That's the word that we stand on. But that is the reason here 
that God tells us through his word to put on this armor, to put ourselves in a posture or a position recognizing conflict. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the strategies, the wiles of the devil. So God's word is saying here that if you're not equipped and if you're not prepared, the strategies of the enemy could prevail in your life all because you didn't take advantage of all that God has prepared for you. Verse 12 teaches us that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Read that part out loud. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We want to get into flesh. We want to deal with folk in the flesh, but we wrestle not with flesh and blood. So we have to see past all that the enemy's trying to do with folk, amen, and recognize that this war that we face and this battle that we're in is one that is spiritual. And he says here it's against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. So the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in is a reality. And, and, and when you think about spiritual warfare and the objective of the enemy, what ultimately is the enemy after? What is his game plan? What is his strategy? What is he up to? What does he want to do? I'm looking at the, 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 the methods of the enemy from the very beginning of time and there is nothing more that the enemy wants to do than to separate you and me from the purpose and the plan that God has for our life. When Adam was hid from God with Eve and Adam uh, is not present when the Lord showed up to meet with him and God uttered those first words after man had sinned, Adam, where art thou? The enemy rejoiced because he had man right where he wanted him, separate from the presence of God, separate from a relationship with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says that Satan, as God of this world, seeks to blind the minds of those that believe not unless the glorious light of the gospel should shine into them and that they be saved. Whatever purpose, whatever plan, whatever position God has for you and me, the enemy's objective is to keep you out of that place, to keep you out of that position. Whatever that position is, the enemy doesn't want you there. And therefore, all the warfare that you face and all the, 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 the attempts of the enemy and using people and places and circumstances and things are nothing more than a front to keep you and me out of that place that God has ordained for my life. Opposition, you've heard me say it a hundred times or more. Opposition is nothing more than opposed position. That's what opposition is. So whatever place God has for my life, whatever purpose that God has for my life, and make no mistake about it, God has a purpose for your life. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not here by chance. You're not the result of a bunch of, uh, of organisms that came together and formed some creature that, that has no purpose. No, you were thought out and planned in the mind of an almighty God whose word declares you are the apple of his eye. He's so aware of you, he knows you're uprising, he knows you're down sitting, he knows your thoughts are far off. The word says he knows the number of hairs we have on our head. Even when that number changes, help us Jesus. Are y'all with me here? Look at your neighbor and say, you are a purpose with a name. Say that with a little more confidence to somebody else. You are a purpose with a name. Y'all got to say it in sync. It sound better. Say it again. You are a purpose with a name. The enemy loves to bring up our past and bring up all our failures and bring up the origin of our birth and all this other mess. But your history does not define your destiny. You are a purpose with a name. And wherever you're sensing the most warfare, that could be because that is the place God wants you at. And therefore, the enemy is launching his greatest assault to keep you out of that place. How many people move from a place? How many people move from people? 
in a, that, that, that they never should have moved from, but they moved because of opposition. Do you realize when you let the enemy take you out of a place over opposition, you have likely fallen right into his plan? Now, I can't get into detail with all of you on what the specific plan of God is for each one of your lives. I, I'm, I, that's not what this message is all about. You seek that out with prayer. You seek that out in the word and, and be led in peace and, and, and go forward with joy and, and just weigh the word against your decisions. But I can tell you one thing that uh, relates to every last one of us, and that is God wants to be glorified in my life. God wants to be glorified in my life. Just say that out loud. God wants to be glorified in my life. If you got a situation going on right now that's got you discouraged, look at the situation and say, how could God be glorified in this? You have to know that every given day, God wants to be glorified in our life. That is his ultimate plan for man. That is the purpose that he has for us. And the ultimate agenda of the enemy is to keep us from fulfilling that plan, that purpose of bringing God glory. So if he can mock the Lord through us, if he could bring reproach on the Lord through us, if he could misrepresent the Lord through us, that is his agenda. And many believers not having the discernment of this have misrepresented Jesus to the lost to the point that the lost felt justified in their unacceptance of Christ because of the misrepresentation of Christ that they've seen in people that name Christ. That's why when we have something in our lives that don't represent the kingdom of God, we got to get that thing out of our life because how can I have this in my life if I'm going to name the name of Jesus Christ? You can't be wearing an I love Jesus t-shirt cussing folk out. And I dealt with this last week. There are some things we've got to put off if we're going to put on the armor of God. The Lord wants to use your life and my life to bring God glory. The enemy wants to use your life to take that glory away. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the essence of who he is. It is the manifestation of who he is. It is the revelation of who he is. It is the disclosing of who he is. And God has chosen man to be his image. He made man in his image. He wants you and me to bring him glory. Jesus taught this in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, that men should see our good works and do what? glorify our Father which is in heaven. There's no greater plan that God has for every one of our lives than to bring him, help me, glory. Amen. I don't even know if I talked about all that last week, but I, I, if, you, if I did, you needed to hear it again. Glory to God. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8, put this in your notes, says, be sober. For anybody needed that one. <laughs> well, Jesus turned water into wine. The word said, be sober. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's 1 Peter 5.8. So as a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. The enemy cannot devour everybody. Amen. So I'm just going to be, I'm going to make a decision that I'm one of the ones he can't devour. So I can't be confessing about how the devil's busy and, oh, the devil did this and the devil did that. I ain't got time for all that. I don't want to give him that much free air time in my life. Mm-hmm. Now, watch what he goes on to say. And, and so in verse 13, he says, Wherefore, because of this warfare that we're in, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Having done all, to hold your ground. Having done all, to not lose your position. If you think about that, that that's, that's what he's saying here is that I'm not losing my position. I'm not losing my ground. 
Now, when, when you go back and you look at um, the, the enemy's objective in, in uh, seeking whom he may devour, and the word defines him as 1 Peter 5, 8, as, as one that uh, uh, is like a roaring lion. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the wicked flee when none pursue. I don't know who needs this one here. This just come out of, I, I, I was fighting with this one like 30 seconds ago. I'm like, okay, Lord. And he wouldn't let, I, I couldn't get it off my mind. The wicked flee when none pursues. See, based on what we've been doing and how we've been living, we're always setting ourselves in expectation of something. You're never not expecting something. So based on what it is that you've been doing determines what it is that you're expecting. And so if you've been up to no good and then somebody says, what have you been doing? You jump back and say, why do you ask? <laughs> well, why did you get so touchy when I asked? You just, you smell like pizza. I thought maybe you'd been cooking pizza. But obviously you've been stealing it. Because the, the way you responded, let, let me know that you, 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 you are too on guard. You're too touchy. You're too fretful. See, when the enemy comes at us like a roaring lion, it's all about getting us out of place, getting us to move, getting us out of the place that God has called us to be. And so many times, whatever it is that we've been sowing or whatever it is that we've been processing sets up the enemy to do just this very thing to get us out of the place that God would have us. How many people have let their sin separate them from prayer? Have let their sin separate them from God? As if, well, you know, I, I gotta get this thing worked out before I can go pray. I gotta get this thing worked out before I can go to church. I gotta get this thing worked out before I can seek his word because the enemy who not only will deceive us and tempt us, that there's always a threefold uh, uh, role of the enemy's agenda in our life. He, de he deceives, he tempts, and then he condemns. The same devil that tries to get us to sin is the same one that says, I can't believe you did that after we've done it. When he was the one that brought the temptation, that, that made it appealing, and yet brings that message of condemnation trying to separate us from God. It was that voice that Adam and Eve heard that had them out of that place from God. So what were they doing? They were running from God. But not because God said, you better run and hide. I'm going to get you for that. No, it was because the voice of condemnation told them that they could not come back to the presence of God after what they had done. The wicked run when none pursue. Is this helping anybody? See, the enemy doesn't care what means it is, whether it's the voice of condemnation or whether it's because you've gotten involved in something you shouldn't have been involved in. The enemy just wants us separate from the presence of God because that's the master key to life. That's the ultimate answer to all answers, no matter what it is we face, no matter whether our problem is spiritual, mental, physical, financial, marital, Parental, it does not matter. The master key to life is the presence of God. That is the master key that fits all keys. It's like this, this facility here. We got hundreds of doors. I don't know if we, I think we got hundreds. We got a lot of doors. And, and, and based on who is using what part of the facility, there are different keys. But then there is a master key that's supposed to fit every lock. The master key to life is the presence of God. The master key to life is what you get when you pray and your relationship with God and you hearing his word. That's the master key. That is the enemy's objective to keep me out of the presence of God because he knows that is the master key to life. So the opposition that I face, if I just dissect it, it's all about keeping me out of the word, keeping me out of worship, keeping me out of prayer. That's his agenda. Are you with me here? All right. 
See, I got to spend all this time dealing with the enemy's agenda so that you will understand that the purpose, the purpose behind why I need to put these things on. The word tells us in these verses that the reason I need to be armed, the reason that I need this uh, protection and this gear is so that I can stand against the wiles of the devil. That is the purpose. That is the reason. And without understanding something's purpose, help me again, abuse is inevitable. Now, let's go, uh, let's go a little bit further in this here. When you look at the list that's given here of, of this spiritual armor, and, and you see the, the loins being girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, we're going to deal with, with, with all of these things. I remember a time in my life when, you know, I always loved to laugh. That's always been me. I've always liked cutting up and laughing, and, and that's just who I am by nature. That was who I am before I accepted Jesus. That's who I was as Hootie James at Woodlawn High School. I just loved to cut up, clown, have a good time, laugh, make others laugh. If nobody would laugh. I just laugh at myself. I just like to laugh. You know, and if ain't nobody laughing and nothing to laugh about, I'll make up something to laugh about. That's just who I am. I'm driving James to school yesterday, and, and you know, we were kind of a little quiet, dull moment. So I just asked him, had he ever heard of Charlie Horse? <laughs> he said, Daddy, I, I've never heard of Charlie Horse. I said, yeah. I said, he's a little guy, and people have to watch out for him because he runs up behind folk grabbing their calves. Man, he laughed so hard about that. I said, yeah, he's Charlie Horse. <laughs> we got to talk about Charlie Horse, and if your name is Charlie Horse, I hope I have not offended you because this was just something I brought up to lighten up the day. <laughs> if you've ever had a Charlie Horse, you know what I'm talking about, right? Charlie Horse normally comes around about 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, gets you up right in your sleep. If you wasn't praying, you will start real quick. If any of you have ever met Charlie Horse, would you say amen? amen? Okay, everybody knows Charlie Horse. So we're laughing and cutting up. There, there was no, there's no, there's, I don't know a Charlie, I know a Charlie Horse, but I don't know Charlie Horse. But man, we just had to, we had, we laughed about that. That's me. I love to laugh. I like to have fun. I like to rejoice. I love life. But years ago, as I'm young in ministry, not too many years ago, because I'm still young, but, but younger, I, I really felt like when you got in the pulpit, you had to put on a certain etiquette and, and you had to be a certain way and you had to have a certain tone and everything had to be a certain way and you had to be stiff. And I had a hard time because that wasn't me. And then one day I was studying the breastplate of righteousness and we'll talk about this later in the series. But I was studying the breastplate and I went through and just looked at breastplates in biblical times and throughout all history and I found out that, that most breastplates were fluid when I say fluid, it meant they weren't these stiff armor that you might see a knight wearing, but most were actually fluid that you couldn't penetrate them, but they flowed with the, when I say fluid, not water, but, but they, 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 were, they were made of chains or fabric or, or horns that were sliced and laced together that provi provided protection for the chest, but at the same time, it moved with the body. And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me that I could wear righteousness and still be me. That, 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 that I, could, I, could, I could walk in righteousness and still laugh. I might not tell the same kind of joke, but I can still tell a joke. Come on, somebody. And that I could be the me that God made me to be and be a righteous version of me versus the unrighteous version of me that knew Jesus. And that liberated me. I said, man, I can still be me. And he said, you can still be you. I'm like, hallelujah. I like this breastplate. It, 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 I, it changed the way I saw Christianity. It changed the way I saw ministry. And so we'll get to each one of these. And we're not going to get to them necessarily in the order in which they're written, I think they're written in a way of which you might put them on, and, and, but I want to go through and just talk about each one, but the one that I want to deal with first is the helmet of salvation. But I'll, I'll finish the reading here, and he says here in verse 15, and your feet shout with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and we'll talk about that and what that means. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's what, that's what I, I, I'm used to quench 
to put out, that's what that word quench means, put out all the fiery darts of the wicked. I'm able to do that by faith. The enemy throws something at me, but I come back with what God said. Amen. I, that, my faith, my shield of faith, my shield of faith, my shield of what I've heard from the word of God, that's what protects me from whatever the enemy is shooting at me. Jesus is the perfect example of this because in Matthew chapter four, the enemy came to him and, 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 and even misquoted scripture and, and abused scripture to get Jesus to commit sin. He first challenged him with his identity and said, hey, if you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread picking on Jesus, trying to shake up his identity in his father. Why? Because Jesus was the one that said that, that, that if our earthly father knew how to give good gifts, how much more shall your heavenly father give good gifts? Do you remember Jesus saying that? Just nod your head, all right? Then Jesus went on to say that no earthly father, if you ask for bread, would instead give you Stone. He said no father would give his son stone when he needed bread. So what does the enemy do? He comes to Jesus and says, well, you must not be a son. If you be the son of God, command these stones that you have plenty of. Maybe you need to command that they be made bread. What the enemy was really saying was, if you were the son of God, why would God give you stone? Where is your bread? You just broke a fast. You're hungry. Where's your father? He was trying to rock Jesus's identity. That was a dart that the enemy shot at him. But the shield of faith quenched that dart. Hallelujah. When Jesus Jesus responded with what he had heard from God when he said in verse 4 of Matthew 4, hey, you know what? It, get, thee, get thee behind me, Satan. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I might not have bread today, but in these 40 days that I have fasted, my father has given me his word, and his word will produce everything that I need in this life. See, the, enemy, the enemy's dart was quenched because Jesus came back with what he heard from the father. And that pattern continued until Satan finally had to leave him because nothing he shot at him would work because every time he shot a word or a message at Jesus, Jesus came back with what was written. His shield of faith quenched every dart. And that's how you defeat the enemy when he comes in and tells you, you're not gonna make it. You quench that dart by saying, never have the righteous been forsaken or his seed begging bread. When he tells you that, that you're a nobody and that you'll never be nothing, you can give him 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 9, that not only has God saved me, but he has given me a calling and that he has given me a purpose and that the purpose he had for me was established before the world began. Before my grandpappy knew my grandmammy, God already had a plan for my life. Hallelujah. I am a purpose with the name. When you know the word of God, you're able to quench every, fire, every fiery dart of the wicked. But when you don't know the word, the enemy just shoots them and, you, and they get stuck in your head and they just sit right there and, and until you begin to change the way you think about your life and your destiny and the Father. Oh, my soul. We, we got to go through. We, we got to get to all of these. These are exciting things. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit. This is the only... Technically, the only offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I take, I take that, and I take that into prayer. Now, notice that I'm taking the helmet of salvation. I'm taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and I'm taking that into prayer, which is what verse 18 is saying. Well, let's talk about the helmet of salvation for the rest of the time that we have here today. I know it's, it might be night but it's day. All right, still today. And they might be watching this and it's early in the morning. All right? So let's talk about the helmet of salvation. The word salvation, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The word salvation comes from the Greek word soteria. It is a benefit package given to the born again. When I first accepted Christ and, and became a young disciple in the Word, 
I just thought salvation was I was born again and going to heaven when I die. I didn't realize the extent of salvation. And so I want to talk about what salvation is because that's what's supposed to be protecting my head. And th 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 this, this could be one of the most important parts of this armor is protecting my head. And so that's why it's the first one that I want to deal with. And we're, we're not just talking about natural protection. We're talking about spiritual protection of, of, of the mind, the helmet of salvation, the helmet of salvation. Now, let's do this. Let, let's deal with what salvation is. Go back with me to Psalms, the book of Psalms, and I want to go to the 103rd division. So we've talked about the enemy. We've talked about our need for this armor. Uh, we've talked about God's will for our life. We kind of glanced over each piece of this armor, and now we're officially underway. Hallelujah. We got there. Only in the, the second week, we got there. Now, go with me to Psalms 103. If you're taking notes and you've written down the helmet of salvation, which I'd like for you to do, write that down as a heading, the helmet of salvation. We're going to begin to talk about it right now. Underneath that, I want you to write these words. What worries you masters you. What worries you masters you. The helmet of salvation, when you put on the helmet of salvation, you're putting on victory. Hallelujah. You don't put on the helmet of salvation to be a victim. You put on the helmet of salvation to win. Glory to God. You got to have that mindset. And whether you go through the motions every day as we get into this series, if you want to go through the motions and just even say it out loud, perhaps uh, we'll write a prayer that, that, that we can uh, give everybody and, and you just take that home and utter that prayer and go through the motion of putting this on every day. But d despite what routine you do to practice this, I, I want you to see this, this helmet as... Number one, protection, but number two, it, 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 it's my banner of victory. I'm putting on the kingdom name. I'm putting on the kingdom logo. I'm, I'm, I'm putting on this helmet for victory, for representation. When I talked about this same series last week to our middle high schoolers, I asked them what came to mind when they thought about a helmet. The first thing I heard from our middle high schoolers was protection. Then the second thing I heard was is, is that one of the ladies, one of the girls said that they're pretty. And then somebody talked about a logo, that the logo, the team logo is on the side of that helmet representing whose team I'm on. So when I put on the helmet of salvation, I'm putting on the kingdom. Hallelujah. I'm putting on victory. Hallelujah. I'm not putting on defeat. I'm putting on victory. And so watch what David does in light of this in Psalms 103. If you're there, say amen. And we'll read the first two verses, all right? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Read the second verse out loud. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice he's talking to himself. He says, soul, bless the Lord. Soul, don't forget his benefits. This phrase, bless the Lord, shows up uh, five times in this, in this division of Psalms. And the Psalm begins with, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that's in me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, what does this have to do with the heaven of salvation? I'm about to tell you. David is obviously going through something that he's telling his mind to remember. Obviously, there's a list of worries and fears that his mind could easily be filled with. But he's saying, no, bless the Lord. Magnify the Lord. Exalt the Lord. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Boast in the Lord. See, he, he's telling his mind uh, to 
adopt a, a, a victor's mindset. You, you let all these worries and fears and frustrations get you discouraged. You're oppressed, depressed, in a mess, can't rest, living in less, trying to pass yet another test and all that other mess. And you, you've, you've gotten down. The thoughts of your mind have overcome you to the point that they're in control of how you think. They're in control of what you're saying. They're in control of how you are living. These thoughts have taken over. They have overcome you. Whatever you worry on, whatever worries you, masters you. So, when you look at, am I victim or am I victor? The, 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 what separates the two is which has conquered your mind. Have thoughts conquered your mind that have made you victim? Or have thoughts conquered your mind that have made you victor? Which, which, which one are you? Are you victim are you, Victor, in both cases, something's been overcome. The either thoughts have overcome you or you have overcome those thoughts. Now, so David knows the answer. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. If you're one that writes in your Bibles, next to that verse, I want you to write Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Because we're going to see that same language show up again, and we'll go read that here in just a minute. Now, verses 4 through verse 6, you could call those verses the salvation package. Come on, glory. David is telling his mind, don't forget the salvation package. Look at your neighbor and say, don't forget the salvation package. See, whatever it is I'm being hit by, I need to remember the salvation package. I need to put on the helmet of salvation. I need to put on salvation. Why am I putting on my salvation? So that I won't forget what I received of the Lord when I was born again and entered into his salvation. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, give, let me give you a couple of, uh, a couple of quotes. Well, let, me, let, me tell you, let me read these first, all right? So here's the salvation package. We'll start in verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. That's, that's in the salvation package. So if you need forgiveness, there it is. It's in the salvation package. Glory to God. See, I need to know that. Many people walk outside of forgiveness because they don't feel like they deserve it. Forgiveness is the one benefit that God offers that so few receive because it's the one that by pure need says, I don't deserve. Y'all need to let that, come on, let that, let that get in there. When you ask God for forgiveness, you're saying I've sinned. You're saying I missed the mark. You, you, you're saying that I did something that you told me not to do or I didn't do what you told me to do. That means you're not in right standing. And so the enemy uses that to say, you can't pray, you can't ask God for forgiveness. Who are you to ask God for this? You're, you, you, you are disqualified, you are put out. But, God, but David obviously recognizing this says, hey soul, don't forget his benefits, don't forget his benefits. And one of the benefits is he forgives all iniquity. That's a benefit that God has given us knowing that we would need. Now watch this. He says, who healeth all thy diseases. That's in the salvation package. Glory to God. When sickness is hitting my body, I need to remember the salvation package. When disease strikes my body, I need to remember the salvation package that he heals all diseases. Glory to God. Verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who redeems thy life from destruction? I need to know that. When I'm 
driving down the road, when I'm going through life, and I know the enemy comes to kill, steal, and what? Destroy. I need to know that benefit that's in the salvation package that he redeems my life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, that I am overshadowed with love and tender mercy. And the word says that his mercies are brand new every morning. That means you've never lived a Wednesday on a Tuesday's mercy. No wonder weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I get brand new mercy every single morning. I'm crowned with it. Hallelujah. Verse 5, who satisfies thy mouth with good things. That's physically and spiritually. Satisfy my mouth with good things. He did that for me just today. My wife made some chicken and dumplings. Glory to God. That's what we have for supper. Black-eyed peas, chicken and dumplings. The Lord satisfied my mouth with good things. But I love to look at the spiritual side of this, and that's when I speak with my mouth the word of God. He satisfies my mouth with good things. He brings those good things to pass in my life so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. That's a part of the salvation package. Verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. That, 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 that's in my salvation package. And David is saying here in a prayer, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. He's saying, man, you got to get your mind on the right thing. You got your mind in the gutter. You've got your mind on all the wrong things. You've got to renew your mind by what, you've set, what you're setting your mind on. Now, real quickly, because I want to get this out in the next uh, uh, five, eight minutes. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 2. The helmet of salvation is all about protecting my thought life. Protecting my thought life. Why? Because what worries me masters me. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We become the product of our thought life. You will become what you constantly set your attention on. You will inevitably walk in the image of whatever you are constantly setting in front of you. Whatever it is that you watch by way of video, whatever music you listen to in your ears daily, you will begin to walk in the image of what you constantly pour in your mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you don't want to become it, don't let it in your heart. Now watch this in Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll look at it in verses 1 through 3. Helmet of salvation. When the children of Israel got afraid after the Lord led them out of Egypt, and they're panicking because the enemy was coming, God spoke through Moses and said this in Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. God had to remind Israel after he had already brought them out of Egypt, when the enemy came after them, you stand still and, and see the salvation of the Lord. We, we have to daily remind ourselves of God's salvation and if you're like me, when I was a young believer, I thought salvation was something I would experience when I died. Man, early in my faith, and I'm not minimizing heaven because that's really what it's all about. The Bible says, look, if you have to go through life missing pieces and parts, that's, that, it's, it's better that you go into heaven, you know, having miss, lost some stuff than to go into hell whole. So sometimes we get so caught up in what we don't have. But Jesus said, if your left arm offend you, cut it off. It's better that you get rid of that and die and go to heaven than, than you be so caught up with your left arm that you end up going in hell. He was saying, there's nothing in life worth gaining that would cost you your soul. That's what Jesus was saying. But yet many believers get so caught up in what they can gain in life that they forget the real deal is heaven. If you threaten my life, what, are you going to threaten me with heaven? That's, the way, that's why Jesus said, why, why would you fear man 
who after killing the body can do nothing more. But fear him rather who can destroy both body and soul and spirit in hell. I thank God I'm saved. I don't want to minimize going to heaven. Hey, glory to God. I've read about heaven. I'm excited about heaven. But even if heaven what I have re- wasn't what I have read, like the old song says, even if heaven was a wooden gate that was swinging on leather hinges, if Jesus is there, come on, somebody, it's heaven to me. Amen. I got two little claps. Y'all ain't even getting excited about heaven. If you can't get happy about heaven, what can you get happy about? I'm not trying to pick on him to say it. Thank God for eternal life. That, that, that's what it's all about. However, we don't have to live a life of Hades while we wait to go to heaven. Salvation doesn't start when you die. It starts when you get born again. When you entered into Jesus, you entered into salvation. You're saved. You've entered into that package. You've entered into that promise already. Hallelujah. So watch this in verse, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. I'm almost done. I'll be done here in a few minutes. He says, therefore... And we, we'll talk about this therefore later because anytime you read the word therefore, it is therefore reason. Boy, y'all got it. So therefore, and if you look at the last word in chapter one, what, what's the last word in chapter one? Salvation. So the topic is salvation and then chapter two begins with what? Therefore. So I'm just letting you know it's connected and it's all about salvation. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed or attention to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Let what slip? The words that we've heard. So wouldn't you say that David in Psalm 103 was letting some stuff slip and he recognized it and he immediately said, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Forget not his benefits. What was David doing? David was saying, you're letting the promise of God slip in this. You've let worry take over. You've let fear take over. You've let depression take over. You've let anxiety take over. You've let other thoughts take over. Hey, hey, bless the Lord on my soul. See, sometimes when you enter into worship or praise, whether it's in a setting like this where we're all gathering together in an assembly or whether it's in your home or driving down the road in your car, not everybody can just flip a switch and they're ready to worship the Lord. For some of us, it is a process of entering in because we have to reset some things and be like David and say, wait a minute, shake the day off. Forget what happened on the job. Shake the day off. Forget what's happening right now at home. Shake the day off. Forget how much money you don't have in the bank account. Shake all that off. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I can't let what's going on in my life take over the mindset I put on my helmet of salvation. I'm always salvation-minded. Hallelujah. And so the word says here, give heed to what you've heard, lest at any time you should let them slip. I'm almost done. I'll get through verse 3 and we'll close. He says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? How are we going to get out of this trouble? If we neglect, neglect what? So great salvation. Let's read that part up to the word salvation out loud. Ready? Read. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So God is saying, hey, how are you going to get out of whatever it is you need to get out of when you are neglecting your salvation? So can you see how that ties back to Psalm 103 when David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What was David saying? He was saying, I'm going to give heed. I'm going to give attention. I am not going to neglect that God forgives my sin. I am not going to neglect that he heals all disease. I will not neglect that he satisfies my mouth with good things. I will not neglect that he redeems my life from destruction. I will not neglect that he executes righteousness and judgment on my behalf. I will not neglect that he renews my youth like that of the eagle. I will not neglect the, the promises that are in God's salvation package because if I do, my soul is not going to bless the Lord. 
So when you look at the helmet of salvation, it's about putting on God's salvation where you're, you're, you're meditating on the promise of God. You're thinking on the promise of God. You're singing songs about the promise of God. That, that, that's your meditation all day long. You're wearing the salvation. You're wearing it as your helmet. It's what's protecting your mind. How shall we escape? If we neglect, if we neglect so great salvation, how, how, how will I escape hell if I neglect the salvation Jesus gives me? And now that I'm born again, how will I escape all the, 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 the war fair of the enemy on my life if I neglect this great salvation? I have to give heed, give attention, put on my helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet of salvation. Do that right quick. Put on the helmet of salvation. You got to see yourself every day. I'm putting my helmet of salvation on. Uh uh, I'm ready. I've got his. Now, you can't do all that and you don't have no word. Yeah. Going through the motions and saying, I put on the helmet of salvation won't do no good if you don't have the word on your mind. You can't say, I put on the helmet of salvation and then turn the radio on and some of much a mess. You got to have this word in your heart. You got to, if you're going to put it on, put it on. Putting, putting on this, this salvation is putting on this word. Make no mistake about it. You can't just go through, oh, Lord, today I put on the help of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. No, you better put some word on. I got to be clear with folk these days and times. Folk will walk out of church and say, the pastor, all I got to do is put on the help of salvation. Everything's going to be all right. That's, took me out of context. Anytime you take text out of context, you're left with a con. You've been conned if you believe that you can take the text out of what I've been saying. Glory to God. Can we give the Lord a hand clap offering for his word? Amen. All right, I want to pray with you. And, and here's what I want you to do as we bow our heads for just a moment. I want you to think about how this looks. I want you just to imagine putting on the helmet of salvation. I want you to see that whatever it is that you're worrying about, whatever it is that you're allowing your mind to just meditate on that's negative and fearful, whatever worries you, masters you. You gotta, in the name of Jesus, you know, I'm putting salvation on. What I think, what I think on is the word, and the enemy can't just put any thought through my head because it's, it's, it, it can't penetrate my helmet. It can't penetrate my salvation. If the enemy throws my past at me, that's all right. I got a salvation package uh, 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 that, that, that covers that. My helmet protects my mind from, the, from all these thoughts that the enemy would try to plant in me. Let me pray with you. And, and again, as we pray, uh, I just want you to think about the deliverance you need in your own mind what is your meditation throughout the day what is your thought process what are you thinking on what are you setting in front of you proverbs 23 7 as a man thinks in his heart so is he proverbs 4 23 out of the heart flows the issues of life whatever you let in your mind if it stays there long enough it takes over that's why i need the helmet of salvation Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask right now, Father, by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would keep us in remembrance. Not let us be forgetful hearers. Your word says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. If there's anybody here tonight and you've just been struggling with fear and anxiety, would you just stand up right now? I want to pray a, a, a specific prayer for you. If you've just been struggling with, with, with anxiety and fear, it, worry, it's mastering you. There is wholeness and there is victory in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, God has not given you the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Father, I pray in faith right now. I set myself in agreement with your word and your spirit. And I pray, Father, tonight, God, in the name of Jesus, that the stronghold of fear, depression, anxiety, and worry 
be broken for your glory tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you for renewed minds tonight. Lord, I thank you for the helmet of salvation tonight. Lord, I thank you that these believers may have walked in one way, but they will walk out of here tonight another way. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you that according to Psalms, the meditation of their heart is pleasing in your sight. God, I pray that your spirit right now would just remove the burden and destroy the yoke that's holding them in bondage to their thoughts. Lord, give them right now the strength and the capacity to put on the helmet of salvation, to walk out of here tonight, Lord, meditating on your word, standing on your promise. Lord, I give you praise for the spirit of victory that's rising up in them right now, Lord, that they are victims no more for whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Father, I declare it here in Jesus' name, by the authority of the name of your Son, we give you praise that whom the Son makes free is free indeed, and that there is wholeness physically, mentally, spiritually right now in Jesus' name, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I invite all of you to pray this prayer with me, specifically those of you that are standing. Please pray this prayer with me. Others, I invite you to pray this prayer with me as well. Heavenly Father, I receive your word. I receive your word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by your word. And I thank you by the hearing of your word. I've received faith and I declare tonight that Jesus is my salvation. I receive what your son did for me. I know he died for my sins. I know he was buried in a borrowed tomb. I know you raised him from the dead that I can take my grave clothes off, that I can walk in newness of life and in the power of your resurrection. So I ask right now for forgiveness of my sins, that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness, that right now you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask you for a renewed mind and that you would keep my mind in remembrance of what I have read, what I have heard from your word, that I would not be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of your work and of your word. And according to your word, I declare, you have not given me the spirit of fear, but you have given me power, love, and a sound mind. So I boldly declare, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And according to your word, I have been given victory. For you have said, whatsoever is born of God overcomes this world and this is the victory even my faith so I declare my victory in your presence just as David prayed I pray bless the Lord oh my soul all that is within me bless his holy name bless the Lord oh my soul and forget not his benefits. In Jesus' name, I receive the benefits of your salvation. I choose to walk in them. I choose to be mindful of them. I choose to wear the helmet of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.